saddle up because there's a lot of work to do this week. Bullet points for today, a terror attack north of the border in Canada at a mosque. Six people dead. The gunman reportedly yelling, Allahu Akbar. Uh, two suspects in custody. No word yet of what's going on there. Meanwhile, the travel ban from seven nations uh, put forth, finalized, I should say, by that executive order by Donald Trump, creating uproar here in some places and other people saying, so what? We'll talk about that. On the program today, Alan Sachs, a traveler caught in a protest in Chicago returning home to Michigan. Liz Peek will be here. Tom Coburn, Dr. Tom Coburn, the senator from Oklahoma, will be joining us, fixing what is broken in Washington. And we'll talk to him about the ban, of course. And Boris Epstein, director of communications for the Trump White House. We've got it all for you. I mean, you, you can't get any, a show more packed than that, can you? That's right. Uh, so saddle up, strap on a helmet, get some coffee. It's the Steve Gruber Show. <laughs> This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it all. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical, it's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. All right, Monday here on the Steve Gruber Show, and it, uh, the breakneck pace continues in news coverage for you and for everybody else. I'm glad you could make it by and stop by the radio today because we've got a lot to cover. We're going to start with the uh, controversy that seems to be getting everybody's attention. In fact, so bad is that I was on BBC World News last night, and the anchor starts arguing with me over basic facts that apparently she and other members of the media don't seem to have a good command of. Let me give you an example. Trump did not create new law here with his executive order to halt for 90 days refugees coming here from exactly seven countries. Iraq, Iran, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, Yemen, and Libya. Seven countries, 90-day ban. Syria could be longer. Depends on how long it takes for Syria to get their act together when it comes to vetting people that are headed out of the country as refugees. What was pointed out in the executive order is that their system is not up to snuff, but the text of Trump's executive order on immigration does not list any particular country except Syria. That formula was in the existing law that his order is carrying out. You see, the law Trump is carrying out, it's called the Visa Waiver Program Improvement and Terrorist Travel Prevention Act of 2015, which was signed into effect by Barack Obama. He signed it on the 18th of December, 2015, part of an omnibus bill signed by President Barack Obama. Again, let's go over that. Signed by Barack Obama. The only thing that Donald Trump is doing, this is where the BBC news anchor was arguing with me. Well, that's not true. Yeah, it is true. But but, but, but Barack Obama didn't enforce it. That's right. He didn't enforce it, but he signed the law into effect. Donald Trump's executive order says, follow the law. Donald Trump, believe it or not, can't make law on his own. Now, he can issue travel bans from certain countries. That is legal under the 1952 Immigration Bill. But in this particular case, he didn't have to. He didn't have to. And, of course, on the left, they are going absolutely bananas. Whether it's at SAG Awards at Hollywood last night or at airports around the country. By the way, coming up a little bit later in the program, we'll talk to somebody who was jammed up by protesters in Chicago returning back to Michigan on Saturday. But here's the real shock. Donald Trump is doing exactly what he said he would do. Exactly what he said he would do. Make America safe, one of his top priorities. Make America safe by defending it both internationally from terrorists 
or in trade deals or to beef up the military or whatever it may be. And I think the biggest shock for the, those on the left is the fact that, oh, my God, he, he's, he's, he's doing what he said he would do, honey. He's, he was honest. Yeah, he was honest. By the way, there were a couple of judges issuing temporary restraining orders, but the Department of Homeland Security, according to all reports, will continue to enforce this ban. And let's just look at what's been done in the first few days of the Trump administration. He's dealt with the TPP and NAFTA, put pipelines back in place that are good for the economy and good for the environment. He signed an executive order to make sure that the Southern... And by the way, the wall, that's something else. The wall along the Mexican border will be put into place. An an executive order to get... Now, how did that happen, do you think? Oh, that's right. There was an existing law on the books, passed in 2005, signed in 2006. But when the Congress came in in 2007, controlled by Democrats, it was never funded. It was never funded. But the idea of a wall at the southern border has always been here. And it's been pretty popular. In fact, real quickly, I want to go to 1995. President Bill Clinton, during the State of the Union address, January, late January 1995, talks about border security and illegal aliens from Mexico. It's clip 16. Go. All Americans not only in the states most heavily affected, but in every place in this country are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public service they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more, by hiring a record number of new border guards, by deporting twice as many criminal aliens as ever before, by cracking down on illegal hiring, by barring welfare benefits to illegal aliens. In the budget I will present to you, we will try to do more to speed the deportation of illegal aliens who are arrested for crimes, to better identify illegal aliens in the workplace as recommended by the commission headed by former Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it. And he got a standing ovation. He got a standing ovation from that point forward for the next, well, for a long time. So defending America against those who would come here and do us harm, whether it was intentional or not intentional, we are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws, so said President Bill Clinton in 1995 during the State of the Union. You know what? He was right. It's time for us to stand up as Americans and say, this is what we need to do. In fact, I would suggest the majority of Americans believe that today and are not terribly concerned about this this dust-up over the 90-day ban of people entering the country from those seven countries. We'll talk more about it after the break. You're listening to a Monday edition of The Steve Gruber Show. Getting your day started with news from around the state and around the world. Common Sense Radio. This is the Steve Gruber Show. All right, it is 18 after. The hotline number here is 888-900-9966. 888-900-9966. I was explaining to the folks across the pond on BBC this other concept that I've had through this entire process, this entire chaotic, incredible frenetically paced nine days, now day 10, of the Trump administration. And that is that those that voted for Donald Trump, 62 million plus Americans, more than 47% of our countrymen that voted for Donald Trump would do so again. And in fact, based on what he's done thus far, I believe he would attract more voters. You see, for Americans, it's refreshing to have somebody take the oath of office and actually do the things they said they were going to do, not waffle, not waver, not back off, not hedge their bets, but to actually do the things they promised they were going to do. It is refreshing, to say the least. 
Now look at that list again. I'm telling you, if, if you look at the North American Free Trade Agreement, renegotiated. Trans-Pacific Partnership, out. Pipelines, like the Keystone XL, back in place and, and being considered again. The wall with Mexico. On track, finally, for the first time since it was approved by the Congress in 2005 and signed into law in 2006, 11 years ago. George W. Bush signed the matter into law in 2006, but then the democratically controlled House in 2007 refused to ever fund the wall. Unprecedented is the word you keep hearing from the media. Unprecedented. And it's being thrown around quite recklessly these days about anything involving the first week in office of President Donald Trump. Now, I realize that most people have not one idea, not one scrap of an idea about actual American history and the truth about things. But I'm going to do my best to help. But the latest misguided and reckless disregard for facts has surfaced over Trump's executive orders to place this ban on these refugees coming here from Iraq, Iran, Somalia, Yemen, Sudan, Syria, and Libya. The media is screaming to anyone that will listen that Trump's move is unprecedented. And any cursory review of American history would show that simply isn't true. It simply isn't true. In fact, boat people from Cuba and elsewhere have been turned away in American history during my lifetime. The Cuban boat crisis, many got here, many did not, many died. Between here and Cuba, 90 miles to our south. And let me share the sad tale of the St. Louis. St. Louis was a German steamer that headed to Cuba in 1939, loaded down with a thousand desperate souls trying to flee Nazi Germany and the beginnings of World War II. Most on board were Jewish. The ship was the focus of great media attention. But despite that, only about two dozen of the people on board were allowed to disembark in Cuba. The ship was then turned away. It headed north in the hope that Franklin Roosevelt and America would take them in. They were so close they could see the lights of Miami. Passengers and crew alike sent desperate messages to to President Roosevelt, pleading for mercy and, and a chance to come to America. For they knew if they returned to Europe, their chances were slim. Their chances were dismal. They pleaded with Roosevelt. He never responded. Short on supplies, including fuel and food, the St. Louis turned back to east, headed back across the Atlantic, first stopping in Britain briefly. 288 people were allowed to disembark there, but the rest were sent back to mainland Europe. Of those 620 people that disembarked in mainland Europe, at least 254 perished in the Holocaust. Some in Dachau. Some in Auschwitz. Murdered by the Nazi machine they begged to get away from. Murdered by the Nazi machine they begged America to protect them from. I do not find fault with Franklin Roosevelt for making a decision to protect America. It is an unfortunate and heartbreaking end for those that were sent back on the St. Louis, but for journalists today to pretend that somehow Donald Trump putting a 90-day moratorium on those coming here from exactly seven countries is ignorant. Do your homework. The ban on refugees from Europe, by the way, and elsewhere, started for two reasons. The first reason was because of the economic problems of the Great Depression in America. So beginning in the early 1930s, in the very first parts of his administration, Franklin Roosevelt greatly restricted any immigrants coming to America from anywhere because there weren't enough jobs. Then it was expanded out in the late 1930s and as the beginnings of World War II took place to prevent people coming to America that could be dangerous because they could be working for the Nazis or somebody else opposed to America. 
Franklin Roosevelt decided that protecting America was first and foremost the Democrat, the socialist, the man that gave us the New Deal, felt America was more worth protecting than those desperate souls from far off lands. We may be a nation of immigrants, as Bill Clinton said here in the previous segment of the program, but we are also a nation of laws. And our laws look to protect American citizens first and foremost. Is that nativist? Yes, it is. Is it prudent? It certainly is. We have a right to protect ourselves as America, no matter who wags their finger or who bumps their gums. We can protect ourselves. We have the right to self-defense. And by the way, in the middle of the country, most people meet this news with a shrug and a yawn, and they'd vote for Donald Trump again. There's a little bit of there's a little bit of word to the wise to those on the left. It's the Steve Gruber Show. It's Monday. The Steve Gruber Show. American Values with Midwestern Common Sense. So as I mentioned, I got in a... uh, a bit of a squabble on television last night with uh, the lady Babita, B- whatever her name was, uh, the the anchor of the BBC World News, and I was in an argument with her on television uh, because she refused to accept the fact, she thought I was just totally out to lunch, that Donald Trump's executive order putting a temporary ban, a, a halt, a, a temporary freeze, if you will, on People coming here from seven countries, except Syria, who needs to improve their vetting process. But when I explained to her that it was a Barack Obama law signed into law in 2015 that included all seven of those countries that was uh, improved and updated in 2016, she'd have no part of it. That's just not true. It certainly is true. And then she told me on there, well, we've got our producers checking. Yeah, you go ahead and do that. Uh, It's called... Again, one more time, the Visa Waiver Program Improvement and Terrorist Travel Prevention Act of 2015, signed into law by Barack Obama December the 18th, 2015. Donald Trump has merely signed an executive order to impose the law that was already on the books. If you don't believe me, let's get the professor in here with his, with his studious ways. Professor Alan Sachs here from the University of Texas Arlington. Professor, good morning. Exactly correct. As what? I understand it, also President Jimmy Carter in 1979, 1980, I forgot the exact date, after the Iranian hostages were uh, uh, captured or, uh, uh, you know, when the American embassy was invaded in uh, Tehran uh, during, the, um, during the Iranian Revolution, uh, Jimmy Carter expelled, I think, uh, most of the Iranian students who were here at that particular time. So... And also, people have to realize, as you do, certainly, that American immigration history has been punctuated all of its history. So when you hear people get up and say, that's not who we are, we have to accept everybody at different times. That's not who we are. And here's the word that... History, we have stopped immigration entirely. Here's the word I keep hearing, Professor, that drives me bonkers. Unprecedented. 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 Never happened before. I just told the story here. Maybe you know the story. Of a, of a ship named the St. Louis. That's right. It, it docked in Havana, Cuba, because we wouldn't let them in here. These were Jewish refugees who had left at the height of uh, Nazi Germany coming to power, and uh, the ship was not even allowed to dock in the United States. That's it right. To Havana, and Sent uh, back at to our Europe. urging, uh, it was not allowed to dock there either. It went back to Germany, and they all were killed. Well, not all of them, but a lot of well, them. A, there a, were a, a vast of amount of them were, were that killed. That was a horrible... Uh, period in American history, but but uh, I don't. But let me say something about that, which I just did. I do not fault Franklin Roosevelt for making that decision, because as a, we we just played a portion of a Bill Clinton State of the Union address from 1995, in which he says, first of all, we have to you know secure the southern border with Mexico because it's dangerous and it's causing huge problems, and he got right. a standing ovation. But he also said, yes, we are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws which he also got a standing ovation for in 1995, and that hasn't changed. That's absolutely correct. 
uh, I think that President Roosevelt at that particular time in American history should have been able to let the uh, St. Louis dock. That, that was a bad period of time. But our, our Im- American immigration history has been punctuated over many, many years by no immigration whatsoever, immigration from, from some countries, mostly European. Uh, only in 1965, when Lyndon Johnson uh, pushed the Congress, and I believe also with the help of uh, Senator Ke- uh, Ted, Ted Kennedy and others late, later on, did our immigration laws open up. That's correct. So, but but so, how, so dare you be, argue, how dare you come to this program loaded with facts? That's right. Also, one other Im- important thing is that when Senator Kennedy talked about uh, loosening our immigration laws and changing them from what was the old quota system, we had a quota uh, from, I think, I uh, forgot the exact period of time, down to about 1965, that you could only admit so many people based on the population already here in the United States. There were so many Irish here, a percentage of Irish could be admitted, or, or from England or France or whatever it is. And it was prejudicial toward those countries that shared at that time our culture. Now, let me jump language, in here. Who they are. Uh, I want to share something here because you're exactly right, but I want to share something here from the headlines that I've not gotten to yet today, and that is a terrorist attack overnight in Montreal City right. in Quebec where there are at least six dead, eight injured Horrible uh, at a mosque where two men came in, masked men, and according to the uh, eyewitnesses were, were screaming Allahu Akbar as they sprayed the crowd with bullets, killing at least six, maybe more, um, but a terrorist attack in Quebec City that looks like it happened at a mosque which is not unheard of in the Middle East, where that is correct. Where, 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 where mosques get attacked by Muslims, correct? That is correct. I mean, uh, I, I don't think anybody knows exactly what happened, who the perpetrators were, but in other parts of the world, I think it's happened in Pakistan, it's happened in Afghanistan, it's happened in parts of the Middle East, where um, uh, Shia attack Sunni and Sunni attack Shia, and that happens. I have no idea if that's what took place there, but uh, that, that has happened in, in, in the past. But also, Senator Kennedy was asked on the floor of the Senate when he was talking about uh, enlarging immigration, changing our past immigration laws. He was asked, Senator, uh, my, I'm, these are my, my, my words, paraphrasing, uh, Senator, will this change our culture? Will it change our way of life? And he replied, no, it will not. We're expecting small numbers. It's going to be small numbers. Everything will, re- will, will remain the same. And, of course, there were subsequent immigration changes, and it changed everything. That's exactly right, and it did change everything because the way it used to be, we had quotas, if you will, from right. each, as you put it, from each nation or from each nationality, and, also, you, and you maintained that. Also, thing that yesterday, of course, I made the mistake of watching the Screen Actors Guild Awards. How'd you enjoy that? <laughs> and why I, why I torture myself, I have no idea. And they were all saying... We are diverse. Look at us. We're all diverse, and diversity is fine. But what diversity has done? Well, what they hold on. Here's the problem. What they mean by diversity is skin color. That's Nothing right. else. Period. But diversity of ideas. That's another yeah. story. The, altogether. Their diversity to the left is skin color only. That you're, you're exactly right. And also, in a very strange way, the diversity that they talk about has quieted down free speech because you're not allowed to attack uh, diversity in any way, shape, or form. And that's where political correctness comes from. So diversity is great, but it's being used also as a battering ram to silence any critics. Exactly right, because that's what they do. They label people. But here's the thing. I'm going to tell you something here in this part of the world. If the election were held today, I believe that Donald Trump would win by a bigger margin than he did previously because i think that those that live in wisconsin and pennsylvania and michigan and ohio look at this whole so-called controversy this ginned up controversy look at 300 people protesting in chicago or a thousand in new york whatever it is and go this is why i voted for donald trump i don't want chaos i don't want anything to do with that and if donald trump thinks it's the proper thing to do to protect this country to keep people out of those countries for seven or for uh, a few weeks then i'm all for it i think you'd win by a bigger margin today than he would have before you might be very well, 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 well correct. Some people have argued that these that these demonstrations are very well organized. That it doesn't matter the issue; people will be out there on the issue, just like they were a week ago in uh, 
Washington with the Women's March. Right. Be other Hold that thought. Coming down the path. Hold that thought, Professor. We're with Professor Alan Sachs, the the sage of of Arlington, Texas. Back after this. <laughs> Delivering Michigan common sense with a big dose of truth and honesty. Take the last train to Pottsville and I'll meet you at the station. You can be here by 4.30. Monday, it's the only way to get your week started properly is with the Steve Gruber Show. You can check out more at stevegruber.com. You can find us on Facebook, The Steve Gruber Show, and to follow us on Twitter at Steve Gruber Show. You see how clever we are there. Uh, you can keep up with everything that we're writing about, talking about, the guests are going to be on, and of course, you can find the podcast of important conversations like this one with the sage of Arlington, Professor Alan Sachs. Um, all right, Professor, let's talk about some other things because there's so much going on. We need to cover the fact that maybe as early as today, President Trump will name his nominee for the Supreme Court. And that probably will generate demonstrations, too. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? I'm joking, but probably it it it, it, it may happen as well. Um, whatever he does, there's going to be demonstrations. By the way, a little bit off to the side, the American Civil Liberties Union has um, been the recipient now of, of millions of dollars in um, in contributions. And yesterday at that Screen Actors Guild Award, one of the uh, people got up there and talked about, send your money to the ACLU. I would argue the ACLU at one time, and by the way, I'm a former president of the Greater Fort Worth chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union many, many, many years ago. The difference is, in those days, we took issues coming from left and right, right down the line. Today, the ACLU, and I'm not as wrapped around them nearly as much as I used to be, I'm in favor of free speech. I don't believe the ACLU is. They pick and choose who they want to defend. In other words, they'll defend, I think, some issues and leave others alone. Uh, there's many things that have happened at universities all over the country, and the ACLU uh, could have entered it, uh, but maybe they were not contacted. That, that could have happened, and they've not taken those cases. So many times I'll read something in the newspaper or on the Internet, and I'll say, where is the ACLU on this? They're not there. But no. boy, on something like this at the airport, the ACLU is there with all their force. And here's the thing. Not all Democrats are on board with this, uh, the, the protests and the nonsense. Of course, those that think they can make political hay like uh, Chuck Schumer are on board with it. But Howard Dean uh, lashing out at Tim Kaine and Chuck Schumer and others saying, this is great, but the Dems, in the, this is a tweet that he sent out, the, the Dems in the Senate actually have to do something about this stuff. You're being left behind by your own base is what... Howard Dean says, I believe he's right. I think that would explain what happened in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And if you continue to berate people because they want to keep America safe, which is Donald Trump's uh, number one issue, and whether you believe this makes it safe or not, it is what the, those that voted for him believe. They believe these sorts of travel bans are the right thing to do, and they support it. Yeah, this, it's going to be, there's going to be more controversy, too, and a little bit off to the side, but it's sort of goes into the same theme of, uh, of, of discussion. I watch a lot of television, especially over the weekend, and I hear a lot of comedians. And I was watching a comedian, a woman, and I don't know her name. It was the most vulgar, despicable kind of, quote, humor aimed at Donald Trump I cannot even describe Of course, the these telephone. are the people that say Donald Trump is vulgar by, say, grabbing her by the, you know, oh, and, and, and he's awful, and therefore we can't support him because we can't have our children listen to him on TV. I was at the Women's March in D.C. Let me tell you something. It was vulgar. Yeah, the things that they were saying would make Donald Trump blush, all right? And this was on television. It was on cable, so they can pretty well do what they want to do. But I've never seen such vulgarity on television uh, leveled at someone. And by the way... Go back to the Screen Actors Guild yesterday. The gentleman who portrayed Lyndon Baines Johnson mm -hmm. uh, did not know Lyndon Baines Johnson. And John he was the Miscall, most vulgar who won president. Award for portraying Winston Churchill yeah. did not really know Winston Churchill. I can Churchill. tell you that the guy that portrayed Lyndon Johnson uh, didn't know because Lyndon Johnson, probably the most profane, That's right. vulgar president in modern American history for sure. I can't say what people are like. 
in the uh, and Winston Churchill was that. an imperialist. I loved him. He was one of the, the great men of the 20th century, but he was an imperialist, and he said things about certain groups that you could never say today. So, and John Lithgow seconded the speech. He didn't make it, but he said, "I support the speech that Meryl Streep made earlier at another award ceremony several weeks ago." Mm-hmm. And he portrays Winston Churchill. They don't even know the people that they're portraying. That's right. They, they live in a world of make-believe. That's right. Um, and, and in this world of make-believe, people like Chuck Schumer, speaking of CSC of the Transition. Who's crying. Yeah, who's crying like, like, a, like a child because of this. <laughs> because it's un-American. Uh, Chuck Schumer says that there won't even be a, uh, they, they'll, they will not approve anybody um, for Trump's Supreme Court. Apparently, they believe they can leave it open for the next four years. I believe that if they try to leave it open for two years, the uh, the uh, the political price they will pay in 2018 will be right. uh, substantial. And the comparisons that they make, then, and they say, well, the uh, Republicans would not let President Obama's, uh, that Merrick Garland, go through. But that's a whole different game, you know, in that last eight months of an American presidency. Yeah, it's a different, it's a different uh, situation. All right, so I guess my my last question to you is, what do you expect this week? Or is it just like sit there with a catcher's mitt and see what comes flying across home plate and see if you can catch it coming from Donald Trump? Well, I think that the Democrats are going to rev it up. Uh, I understand they now want to meet with the Department of Homeland Security and talk to them about what's going on. Uh, We're going to see more demonstrations, I guess, uh, uh, proceeding. The Supreme Court announcement is going to ignite the Democrats, no matter who it is. You know, yeah. so but Donald Trump's going to President Trump's going to hold strong. I, I I believe much in the line of Winston Churchill. All right, I greatly appreciate that. I think that uh, uh, we might see one sacrificial lamb from Trump's cabinet, and I think it might end up being Betsy DeVos. It usually happens, but she seems to be having the roughest road. Uh, maybe that's one that he lets them have a win on. We'll see because she's from Michigan. We like her. Uh, I do anyway. We'll see what happens, but we'll keep up with it. Uh, there you have it, Professor, the Sage of Arlington. See, you've now been you've now been you I know given your moniker. That, there it is. That, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use that all the time. That's wonderful. There you go, the <laughs> Sage you. of Arlington, Alan Sachs, Professor of Political Science, University of Texas Arlington. You can catch him here on Mondays. Back in a moment on the Steve Gruber Show. This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon. Always shoot it all. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you don't stop cynical. It's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. It's Monday. Glad to have you here with us on the Steve Gruber Show for this Monday. Breaking news right now. Um, I just got this. Uh, since Donald Trump took office, according to Les wing activist media commentators and hollywood elite the world has ended at least 49 times since donald trump became president 49 times the world has actually come to an end if you were not aware of it but if you um, listen to left-wing activist media commentators and the hollywood elite there's the number that's the official number as of today that the world has ended 49 times uh i don't believe it's ended i believe that this president Donald Trump is shocking the left by having the nerve to do exactly what he said he was going to do and in a timely schedule, getting it done, getting it done fast. The hotline is open for your comments and your concerns, 888-900-9966. There she is, the lady of the hour, Jennifer, on the hotline. Welcome to it. Thank you so much. I dearly love you, Professor. What the American people don't understand, and it's beyond me why they don't, is that the people that are coming into this country do not have their same values. They are not raised the same way we are. They do not 
they are not taught the same things that we have been taught or supposed to have been taught before they tried to change the educational system. When they allowed these people to come in unvetted, they are coming in with all their philosophies that they have been taught. They're not here to get along with us or obey our laws. They're still bringing with them all their culture, all their teachings, and everything that they have been taught since childhood. The mm-hmm. other thing is, I, I really, I just do not understand why the American people cannot get it through their head that the reason that they want all these illegals to come into this country is to change our culture. So we are not the United States of America. We I do not have our values. I, I just get so upset with that. Well, I agree with you, Jennifer. I think that there's a lot of folks coming here from third world hell holes and war-torn hell holes trying to turn America into a third world hell hole and a war-torn hell hole. They want to turn America into what they left. It makes no sense whatsoever, which reminds me of what Teddy Roosevelt said. If you want to come here, fine. But if you don't learn the language and become part of the culture within five years, you leave. You see, now a lot of folks are not to here to be part of the melting pot. Mexican. Go ahead. I, I, you, may I say one more thing? Of course. I, you call me an old hag if you wish, but I long for the day when I was growing up that when a young man came to the house... He had respect for the girl because if he didn't, her dad would grab you by the collar and shake you up. Men have no respect for the women today, and it's not their fault. They haven't been taught right. The women that were out there marching. No, I, I, trust me, I was I right mean, in the middle of it, Jennifer. Street I, bridges. I was right in the middle of it, Jennifer. I can appreciate it. And thank you for the call so much. Triple eight nine hundred ninety nine sixty six. Whatever's on your mind is is open today talking about the uh, ban on refugees, which, again, is nothing more than Donald Trump enforcing the law signed into law by Barack Obama on the 18th of December, 2015. Tom on the line in DeWitt, Michigan today. Tom, welcome to the program. Hi. Hey, just remind these uh, hypocrite Democrats about the time the Janarino sent the feds in to get Julian Gonzalez, and they came in their bedroom in the middle of the night with automatic weapons to send him back to Cuba. And also remind them about the time that they set the Branch Davidians on fire for no reason at all, really. Well, they burned them to the ground in Waco, Texas, April the 19th, 1993. If That's I, right. Their religious liberty is there, huh? So mm. much for religious liberty is there for the Democrats, the hypocrites. There you go, Tom. Thanks for checking in. Yeah. David Koresh, the Branch Davidians, lit on fire, burned like a bunch of ants in a box. That was the 19th of April, 1993. Uh, By the way, Jimmy Carter banned anyone coming in from Iran, expelled students, ordered 50,000 students, Iranian students, Iranian students only. And anyone not in compliance with the terms of their visas or their papers were deported immediately. Deported immediately, and that was 1979. All right, so uh, these things have gone on for quite some time. By the way, in Quebec, the investigation continuing into the terrorist attack there last evening, six people dead, at least eight injured. The police in Quebec City, Quebec, saying it is a terrorist attack. It happened at a mosque. But eyewitnesses report that those two men with masks, they came to the mosque and attacked with semi-automatic weapons. We're yelling Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, as they murdered those that were there for prayer. As many as 60 or more may have been in prayer attendance. Of course, the women weren't there. It was all men. The women, of course, not allowed to pray with the men because that's the way it is. Because in in that culture, women are second-class citizens. The women were on a different floor of the building. So no women injured in the attack because women are not allowed to be with men during their time of prayer. Anyhow, so the in Quebec, they continue to look into that attack. The hotline number is 888 9966 What do you make of all these conversations right now? Dana checking in from Grand Rapids. Dana, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, um, and good morning to you, Steve. Uh, I'll tell you what I make of all of these, and I want this specially directed where you are and where I came from. You're in Lansing to the Michigan State students, um, the white liberals, and to the U of M students uh, in Ann Arbor. Um, The American-born 
uh, Muslims that have been here for years, there was a study done, 60% agree with Sharia law, 40% think what ISIS is doing is okay, because it's in the name of God. And so if they think that by doing all this protesting, uh, what's going to end up happening is there's not going to be any more student loans for them. There's not going to be any more grants for them because they're not going to be alive. They're going to be the first ones that are going to be targeted because people with big mouths on the left, look what happened in the Russian Revolution. Mm. Uh, the Bolsheviks killed their own because you've got to get rid of the ones that are stirring the pot. So maybe they need to remember that, press their upper and lip or lower lips together before they shoot their mouth off. Well, it's a little too late for history. that, Dana. A little of the... Uh, the conversation is going to continue. Dana, greatly appreciate you checking in from Grand Rapids today. The hotline, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and keep it open today. When we come back after the break, though, Brother Shane will be here. He was traveling home from being out of the country uh, on the weekend and found out that he got jammed all up in um, these protests when he was flying through Chicago on his way back to Detroit. Uh, but more more interestingly, we'll have him talk about that and the, and the protesters because he was in the middle of the scrum. But just as interesting were the comments from the tourists that he was with on the beach down in Jamaica, many of them Canadian. I was shocked at, at what they actually think of, of Donald Trump. And, well, you just got to hear it. It's 14 after on a Monday. We'll be right back. Keeping you in touch with Michigan and the world. All right, well, if, if you miss a week, you miss a lot around here with what's going on, that's for sure. You know, you go on vacation somewhere and don't pay attention to your cell phone or the news for a week. Man, it feels like you've been gone for a year because of the, well, the breakneck pace that Donald Trump is going through, whether it's the TPP or uh, the Southern Wall, the border, the Mexican border, uh, you know, the uh, the wall at the Mexican border, the pipelines for Keystone XL, the list goes on and on and on. Of course, then comes the temporary ban on, on refugees coming from seven countries. Barack Obama's law signed in 19, excuse me, in 2015 and then put into effect by Donald Trump. Of course, the, the left not accepting that. But if you didn't know and you're just flying back into the country, man, it could have been a big surprise. My brother, Brother Shane, was flying back in from Jamaica where he had spent some time on the beach and uh, getting a tan, I suppose. But pretty surprised we landed. Brother Shane, welcome back to the program. Well, good morning, Steve. How are you? Well, I'm um, pretty good. I was, uh, you're right, disconnected for a week. I, uh, but, you know, both ends of that trip were kind of interesting in the travels because we went on the 21st of January. Of course, the day after the inauguration, uh, we made our connecting flight in Washington, D.C. Well, most of the people on the plane when we went were on a direct flight from Detroit to D.C., you know, they were getting I off. Thought, I, I get it. Yeah. The 20, the day that I was trapped in the middle of that March with my wife and my 12 year old daughter trapped right in the middle of it. You were just dropping people off for the party. Well, I felt a little out of place. <laughs> I was listening to a conversation around that plane going as a white heterosexual man. Oops. Yeah. Did you, did, I felt guilty. did you, had, guilty. Did, did, did you place your hand strategically to protect yourself in case of emergency? <laughs> uh, well, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. Shane had fear in his eye on that plane, and I, I can only imagine the conversation you were surrounded with because, you know, I got to hear much of the same. But it was a, it was an educational experience for for young Madison because she's in this uh, this crowd of people going, "No, wait a second, don't I have the same rights as a man?" And I'm like, "As long as I've been alive, you do." Um, you know, maybe maybe a hundred years ago, uh, Woodrow Wilson tried to prevent that, honey, but he had a stroke, and his wife Ruth made sure that. Uh, you were able to get that, or whatever her name was. Well, um, they, were talking about, they were talking about strong women. I'm saying, I like to introduce them to my three daughters. They want to talk about strong women. And uh, so it just frustrated me. But we went down to Jamaica, disconnected for a week, came back on Saturday. And you got, got a whole new and you got a whole new group of protesters to deal with. Sure, we get up. I've never switched planes in Chicago through the international term Chicago before, so it was a new experience. We get off the plane. We go through, because we only had uh, carry-ons, through a speed line. Came out of that exit from there, and we walk in this lobby, and we can't move. 
we just were packed right in there. So we're pushing and shoving, and all of a sudden I realized there's signs all around us. And there's these chants going on, and I'm looking around and protesting not only uh, the band, but LGBTQRSTUV things and uh, the pipeline and every other thing. Every other liberal cause you can imagine is, is on display there. And, and, and so, uh, all right, so you're heading to your gate through a, through a mob, uh, a mosh right, pit. Well, we have, the problem is we didn't have a gate assignment. So we're trying to find one of the uh, boards that tells where the departures are going to occur and what gate to go to. Just because it was a short flight at the end of a long trip, they didn't give us a gate assignment immediately. Right. So I'm looking for it. We go around the crowd to go down where I see um, boards, and we can't get through because shoulder to shoulder to shoulder are these uh, Chicago police officers. Nice and gentlemen. And big men. Yeah, nice gentlemen. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I'm going, uh, what do I do? Well, they say, where are you supposed to be? He said, don't know, can't find. He says, the one guy was nice, says, jump on the train and try uh, terminal such and such. But the one guy said, where are you going? And I said, Detroit. He actually, here's a, a Chicago cop in the middle of this, tell me, I like people from Michigan. You know, they're the most industrial people I've ever met. And he's truly saying this to me and going, Really? Now? Cool. Well, while he's staring down, you know, a frothing mob of, of protesters. Now, he, but before I run out of time, yeah, I got a couple minutes here. But uh, what I also found interesting because we talked about this yesterday was not the fact that you had to deal with protesters coming and going, but the attitude of the people that you met in Jamaica while you were down there on vacation, most notably the Canadians. And there were a lot of Canadians, from what I understand, with you and their attitude about American politics, about Donald Trump, about Justin Trudeau, their own prime minister. What can you tell me? Well, yeah, um, the groups that we were down there, there were several different, you know, larger travel groups, and the one was based on Toronto, so there was a lot of Canadians down there, and Canadians I've always found to be much more astute with American politics than most Americans, but they yeah. were all pro-Trump, almost to the, to the person, and uh, I said something to this one gal, we were on a catamaran ride, and we're just chatting away, and Something came up about Trump, and I said, well, you guys are blessed with Trudeau. And she told me if I said that again, she'd throat chop me. Um, <laughs> so they don't, they don't think much of young, uh, young Justin? I mean, he is the last liberal leader that's going to survive in the Western world. I mean, they're all, they're all falling like, you know, like bowling well, pins. But why do, you, why do you think that is? Why do they love Trump? Well, they see, they see the same problems. You know, there was a shooting in, uh, in a mosque in Quebec today. They have a lot of overflow, and they're connected to the United States. You know, the Canadians all know that that busiest border crossing in the world sits between Windsor and Detroit, and they know the commerce that goes back and forth between the two countries, and they know about Trump because it affects them more than Trudeau affects them. Well, I'm, well you know, I'm going to say, I bet they're really excited to find out today, or this week when they woke up, to find out that Justin Trudeau said, well, any... Any refugees that, uh, that America won't take, we'll gladly accept right here in Canada. I bet that'll excite them a lot. Well, I'm sure it will. And, uh, you know, because the uh, refugees have figured out that they probably can get across the Canadian border, too. But uh, Yeah, the, to, longest, uh, the longest undefended border in the world. But I, th- I think that's interesting. First of all, well, don't leave again for a while, all right? Just stick around because you miss a lot in, in the time that you're gone. But- <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. I'm going to stick around just to help you. Yeah, well, I, well, I, well, I greatly appreciate that. All right, it's Brother Shane, everybody here on the program. Thank you, Shane, as always. All righty. There yeah. you have it. And, and just, I'm, I, was, I thought it was fascinating when I was talking to him here uh, yesterday. saying, you know, you should come on the program and tell people about the demonstration. But more importantly, the fact that the Canadians that you're on holiday with uh, embrace Donald Trump and don't have much use whatsoever for Justin Trudeau, their own prime minister, and like Shane said, a terrorist attack in Quebec City overnight. We'll tell you more about that. Still to come here on the Steve Gruber Show. Delivering Michigan common sense with a big dose of truth and honesty. Welcome back to it. My next guest, Liz P., columnist for foxnews.com and the Fiscal Times. Uh, a lot to talk about, Liz. Uh, welcome to the program. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I want to play a very quick clip uh, for you, if I may. Go ahead with that, Alex. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. 
It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it. All right, there you go. Good. Uh, there's Bill Clinton, State That's of the Union, it. 1995, standing ovation from everybody in attendance, including the Democrats, but now somehow uh, Donald Trump issuing an executive order that does nothing more than enforce the law signed on the 18th of December 2015 by Barack Obama, and suddenly he is a, a bigot and, uh, and, and all of these things, Liz. What do you make of it? Well, I, I tell you the truth, that, I mean, as you point out, and, and the clip is excellent, the hypocrisy is pretty stunning. And, uh, you know, let's kind of dial it back a moment and re recognize that this temporary ban, which is what it is, on processing refugees coming into the country from nations that are hotbeds of terrorism is very popular. If you look at the polling, I think it's like 57% of the country is in support of this. So actually, I think the problem that erupted over the weekend is the Trump administration is new, it's unsettled, it's unpolitical in the sense that they don't have political backgrounds. They got to get their act together because the last thing Trump wants to do is be seen as inept. And I think really what happened over the weekend is this is the first time that they've issued an order or a decree or an executive order or whatever that really wasn't fully fleshed out. It didn't consider all the ramifications. And that is, I think, the biggest problem here. I mean, yes, there are going to be people protesting anything you do with immigration because it's a hot button issue. Anything, Anything that Donald Trump does, it, if, Donald Trump, say, if Donald Trump yeah. says it's lunchtime, they protest. <laughs> I think that's true. Uh, that's clearly true. But you don't want to feed that machine. And unfortunately, there, you know, the, the back and forth thing on whether green card uh, holders were involved and so forth and so on kind of. Uh, well, we know the we, answer to that now. The answer is no. Green card holders will yeah. be vetted again, and they get to come on in. Here's what I, you know, and I continue to uh, come back to this same thought, which is in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, if the election were held today, I think Donald Trump gets more votes because he's yeah. doing exactly what he said he's going to do, which is make America safe, put America first, put America's laws first. And I, I watched this Rasmussen poll where he's up to 57% approval rating. People say, well, that's, a, that's one of those polls that's leaning to the right. It's also one of the polls that predicted he was going to win on Election Day. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. No, look, I, I totally agree. Again, I don't, I, I mean, what worries me just a little bit here is there does seem to be a certain amount of chaos in Washington, in the, in the White House. And uh, I really, you know, I don't want that to happen because Donald Trump was elected in part because he was a business tycoon and he was going to surround himself with people who had managerial experience. What we know about the Obama White House, particularly in the beginning with all that mess of trying to roll out a health care program and so forth, they were not good managers. And a lot of things got really messed up. Uh, we're, you know, obviously, we're hoping that Trump does better because, as you point out, and in fact, I was working on this over the weekend on a column, the truth is he's not as popular as Obama was. But his policies are much more popular. And so focusing on the man is fine. Let them let Chuck Schumer do that. But the truth is, it's going to hurt Democrats if they don't figure out that he's doing what people want him to do. Well, the fact of the matter is he's doing exactly what people want him to do. And, and so you've got some some protesters that turn out in, in New York and Chicago. And so these people didn't vote for Donald Trump anyway. It doesn't <laughs> matter. True. I mean, these, the, these are not his supporters. And, and, I'll, and I will tell you here in the heartland. Uh, in, in the Midwest, in Middle America, in the Rust Belt. People watch that on television. They hear it on the radio, and they say, you know what? I support him. Now, again, they may not say so in a crowded restaurant because they don't want to get heckled and, and, and yelled at. The same phenomenon that occurred in November of 2016 will occur again in November of 2020 if this kind of behavior, because a lot of people have a sense of fairness in America, and they don't believe that every time Donald Trump does anything that he gets yeah. under attack, there's a sense of fairness. Let the guy have a shot. And even people yeah. that didn't vote for him are like, no, wait a second. He deserves a chance. I agree. And again, because he's following through on things he talked about, the douche. I mean, you know, whether it's the TPP or the Keystone Pipeline or whatever, these are popular measures. So there has not been a pause in the assault on Donald Trump from the media. And 
By the way, I don't know about you. I am so tired of John McCain and Lindsey Graham. I don't totally. know when they became the self-appointed uh, sort of, you know, authorities of the of the traditional Republican establishment. But they're as much of a pain in the neck as Chuck Schumer at this point. Well, they, because they, they clearly see are. the narrative that the Republicans aren't with Donald Trump. I don't really know why. I don't know why they're doing this. I mean, well, I know I, why. I, Lindsey Graham came in last place out of a out of a yeah. field of twenty people. John McCain was insulted and, and improperly so by Donald Trump. Donald Trump crossed the line when he talked about uh, John McCain being captured. That was wrong. Yeah. He should have apologized and, and been done with it. But instead, he's had these over these hard feelings. But again, both of these guys are, are weakling Republicans anyway, and I don't care. They've been around for a long time. I don't have much use for either one of them either way. I respect John McCain's war service, John McCain's war service. But after that, as a politician, I, I have, have no use. And Donald Trump got more votes than he did. Think about it. No, I, I totally am on board with that. I, I think it's really sort of offensive that they are always like the first to jump into every controversy, uh, slamming the president. And, you know, as you say, I think around the country, people have to be just, as you say, the sense of fairness. Give the guy a chance. There has been not a moment that the Democrats have given him a chance. And by the way, let's not forget that in Trump winning Trump won states. There are 10 uh, Democratic senators coming up for re-election in two years. If this keeps up, the Republicans could end up with a supermajority in the Senate. And boy, that is going to be big, big trouble for Democrats. So I honestly don't know what they're thinking. Well, there's no question about that. You look at uh, Claire McCaskill in Missouri. You look at uh, Heidi Heitkamp in North North Carolina. I think Joe Manchin can make it, but he's got to play ball, right? I, I believe he's well, got to play ball. And he has been a little bit. He has. He's like the lone ranger out there in terms of kind of reading the tea leaves. Well, I mean, let me ask you this, because you touched yeah. on something important before you go. Does the, does the John Kennedy wing of the Democratic Party exist anymore? It doesn't appear to. Uh, I mean, if you look at the people who are running uh, to lead the party, they're really just solid core progressives, and proudly so, and they just don't seem to understand that, uh, you know, they, they lost the election because they lost the, exactly those Democrats, the blue-collar, working-class Democrats who traditionally have supported the party, and they defected in droves to Donald Trump. My guess is they're applauding this measure that, on immigration, uh, and, you know, Democrats are just doing nothing to help themselves. I think you. I think your guess would be exactly right. I think they are applauding this. I think they're coming over even stronger behind Donald Trump. And I believe if the election were held today, uh, Donald Trump might get more states than he got the last time around. But we'll keep he an might eye win on the it. Popular vote. Yeah, he might even win the popular <laughs> vote with or without illegal voting or whatever. Uh, Liz Peak, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you for having me. Have a great week. You too, Liz Peak from FoxNews.com, the Fiscal Times, and every now and then you see her on TV as well and a regular contributor to The Steve Gruber Show. Your phone calls after the break. Taking a closer look at the stories that affect you most with a big dose of common sense. All right. Uh, let's take your phone calls. Uh, the phone line open at 888 The Common Sense Hotline there for you. Uh, so line it up and, and make it happen. Uh, talking a, a lot today about the executive order to put a temporary halt on immigration and refugees from seven countries. Syria could take a bit longer because until they have proper vetting procedures in place, which they currently do not because of the civil war situation there, it could take a bit longer. Michael is in Flint, listening to WFNT fourteen seventy on the AM dial. Michael, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? Good morning, Steve. What's on your Good mind? Uh, um, you know, I was thinking about the word simulation. Uh, that's probably going to be another hot word there. You know, if they use that, because I even think Barack Obama can spell it. And what do you mean by you that? Know, I, 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 what, what What is your concern? Uh, the refugees coming in, and you know the simulation of of people, of refugees or immigrants coming into this country. Because I don't even think Barack Obama could spell it. You know, even though he's not in now, but for eight years, you know, I, there was no simulation of anybody coming in. No, that's people came here and set up the, and that's part of the complaint that a lot of people have is that um, 
these people are coming here. They're not here to come into the melting pot. They're not melting at all. They're coming here to make their own uh, deal from what, wherever they came from, and they're not trying to be part of America. They don't care about American traditions or American history or American culture. They care none of it. And, and, and because they vote left, they're being encouraged to do so. Can you imagine if those coming over the southern border you know, voted uh, by l- wide margins for Republicans? That wall would have been built years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. Uh, great. True. Thank you for checking in, Michael. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, assimilation is not happening the way that it it is supposed to. Like Little Italy and Little, you know, Havana and, you know, Little Tokyo and all these different places and different, you know, enclaves you'd have inside of big cities. But Chinatown, you know, whatever it might be, but you would have uh, these people that would become part of the American fabric. They would blend in. You don't see that now. You don't see that the way you once did, which, and again, I'll go back for a history lesson, but this is so easy. So easy. You go back to Teddy Roosevelt, a hyphenated American is no American at all. I happen to agree with that. Here, here's something else for you to consider, and, and I'll leave that phone line open for uh, a few more minutes here. Chili's, not my favorite, but Chili's Restaurant. Might not even be on my list at all after this this story that I read at redstate.com. Chili's restaurants in two states apparently joined forces with Planned Parenthood to raise funds for that organization. From lifenews.com comes this little snippet. Earlier this week, Planned Parenthood abortion business affiliate in Indiana and Kentucky posted a promotional code its supporters could use to request that Chili's donate 15% of the pre-tax meal purchase to benefit the abortion corporation. Uh, I can't, it's in Indiana and Kentucky, and I've got the, the flyer is right here. Bring this voucher when you visit Dine In or To Go, the Chili's location identified below, and 15% of your pre-tax purchase will benefit Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky. It was good from January 1st of 2017 through March 31st of 2017. I, I don't see how that's a very good business plan, boys and girls. I'm I'm just saying. Let's go to Craig standing by on the hotline in Lansing. Craig, welcome to the program. Hello. Uh, just my thoughts on assimilation. I think that's part of the problem when you start talking about refugees and uh, legal immigrants. Um Illegal immigrants and refugees will not assimilate because they're not here to be an American. Um, it's kind of like uh, your house is on fire and your neighbor that you hate uh, invites you to stay there for a little while while they rebuild your house, but you never seem to go back to your house. Um, you, you just move in and take the, over his house. I, I get your point. It, I get it. Right, and, and I think that's part of the problem with with uh, the refugees. Um, we yeah, can, they, they come we here for third world plant. hell holes, and that's what they want to turn it into. Go on. And the other thing is we can help 12 times as many with the same amount of money if we just do it there. Well, and let that's, me ask you one other an thing. And, and, nobody's making. And, Craig, I want to make one other point. Thanks for stopping in. I'm going to make another point, Craig. Thanks for the phone call. And the point is this. We have millions of children in this country that go hungry every day. You have mothers in shelters because they are the focus of abuse. You have veterans that are homeless on the streets of America. And maybe we ought to turn our sights to take care of our own before we continue to let the floodgates roll into America. More than a million immigrants a year come to America legally, more than the rest of the world combined. So while you're beating up on America, let me just say stop because it's just not accurate. Let's go to Randy. Randy's on the road. Randy, welcome to the program. Hey, Steve, good job teeing it up. Now let me smack it real hard and hit it off the park. What you're saying is absolutely true. It's not just young people that are starving, but also people of all ages that are starving for hope. Uh, I've been driven from one industry to the next because we've been getting it handed to us through NAFTA. And uh, I have to commute now, long distance, and I drive a car that I can barely fit my ego into. (laughs) And I have a kid, I have two kids who didn't go to college because, one, I wasn't able to afford it, 
And two, they're not dreamers, and they're having that all offered to them right now. And even this current administration, there are rumors that they're within the administration, they're struggling with what to do with that part of it. And i got to tell you, restore hope to your own people first. Give them a chance for a better tomorrow before you start even considering giving it to people that aren't even legally citizens of this nation. Or don't want to become Americans in every sense of the word either. They don't care about the 4th of July or or whatever it may be. Randy, good luck on the road out there, buddy. I appreciate the Thanks. call in. Uh, I'll take a good few job, more of your Steve. phone calls. Thank you. I'll take a few more of your phone calls after the top, uh, right after the break here. I'll get right back to it. Robert, stand by. The rest of you stand by. The hotline number, 888 It's Monday, and you're listening to The Steve Gerber Show. Quickly to the hotline, Robert standing by in Lansing today. Robert, welcome to the program. Yes, um, calling about Planned Parenthood. Okay, go oh. ahead. Yeah, uh, calling about Planned Parenthood. I noticed over the weekend the media was talking about Donald Trump commemorating the Holocaust, but not mentioning the Jewish people by name. We should hold that same media accountable for Planned Parenthood and the abortion business, that they constantly talk about the right to abortion, but they never mention the unborn children by name. Well, there you go, Robert. Greatly appreciate you checking in. Uh, and Chili's having uh, a special in Indiana and Kentucky that you could contribute part of your the cost of your meal to Planned Parenthood. I don't think that'll be a big marketing win for them. Uh, just a crazy idea. Leo is now checking in from Ann Arbor, listening to 1600 Wham! over there. Leo, welcome to the program. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I didn't vote for Trump, but I did want to comment on the the wall and then on the the ban they're trying to do. And uh, I, you know, I, I, when I read the actual thing, at first I was kind of upset in this and that, but I realized most of those countries that are actually being banned are like like the Wild West over there. There's like no government. That's and right. So, uh, and I'm I'm thinking, I mean, for my own safety too, you know that I think Obama did a, I was looking some things up that my conservative friends were showing me and that I had like uh, in 2011, I think Obama did a ban for the Iraqis coming in. That's correct for and six think, months. And I don't see anything wrong with it. I think, I well, think here's the, something else, uh, Leo, this is important. Barack Obama signed this law that's being enforced. All Donald Trump says is it's, uh, did in his executive order says now it's time to enforce the law enforce signed uh, by Barack Obama in December of 2015. He's he's just right, enforcing the law on yeah. the books, and I don't I don't see anything wrong. I, and I I I do hang out. Most of my friends are liberal. I maybe have like a, a few conservative friends, but they did show a good. That was a good point. That you know I was kind of getting upset for nothing, and I realized that the countries like like I said that they were banning are actually countries that you would want to ban. Actually, they can't remember Leo. People. Remember the truth is a very powerful tool. And, and you never know, Leo, you might pull the lever for Donald Trump next time. Just hang in there. Hang in there. I appreciate the phone call. Thank you very much. It's the Steve Gerber Show on a Monday. We'll be right back. This is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon. Always shoot the door. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical. It's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. All right, it is Monday. Glad to have you with me here today. The hotline number, 888-900-9966. From Marquette to Monroe and all points in between the Michigan Talk Network carrying the Steve Gruber Show. Uh, We have some new affiliates to announce here in the next few days. We'll be sharing those with you as soon as they go hot. Uh, And then we've got a rollout coming a little bit later. 
I believe, in April. So I appreciate the support. It's becoming a movement, my friends. It's becoming a movement. Now, let's cut through the nonsense and get to the facts of, of what's going on with this uh, hysteria, this, the, the latest hissy fit um, over Donald Trump. What has he been in office? Nine days? Maybe ten? How many hissy fits have you seen from the media, from Hollywood, from the left in general? I mean, you should have one of those little clickers you have. My father used to have them when he was fishing, a little clicker on his fly vest. Keep track of how many fish he caught in a day, you know. I think he cheated once in a while, but I'll, that's a story for another day. But anyhow, he did click. Maybe we should do that for hissy fits and panic attacks and, and uh, flat-out hypocr- hypocrisy and everything else you see. Unprecedented. A word being thrown around so recklessly these days by the media that just about anything involving Donald Trump is apparently unprecedented. And then I realized that most people out there consuming this garbage, and remember, garbage in, garbage out, uh, the human mind is the same as a computer. If you fill it with garbage, what do you think is going to come back out of the mouth? Garbage. Anyhow, uh, most people don't realize uh, what the truth is. Most people have no actual working knowledge of American history or the truth. The latest misguided and reckless disregard for facts surfacing, of course, over Donald Trump's executive order to place a temporary ban. That's right. Temporary ban on refugees coming from seven countries, Iraq, Iran, Somalia, Yemen, Sudan, Syria, and Libya. Syria could be longer because they have uh, bigger problems getting people vetted on that end. The media screaming to anyone that will listen that Trump's move is unprecedented. Holly weird in in their get together at the SAG event last night, you know, screaming that it's racist and bigoted and so on and so forth. Uh, But any cursory review of American history would show this is simply not true. In fact, Jimmy Carter, in 1979, after the American embassy in Tehran was overrun by radical Islamists, banned anyone from Iran, and then expelled Iranian students by the thousands, threw them out of the country. You forgot, they forgot to tell you that though, didn't they? Because the left-wing activists, media commentators, and Hollywood elite, they believe that the world has come to an end, I think, 49 times was the last count. In just the last nine days, the world has ended 49 times, according to the Hollywood elitists and so forth. But let's stick to the facts. That's what we'll do here. And the fact is, Donald Trump is doing exactly what he said he would do. He's doing exactly as he promised. It's just shocking, I realize. 62 million Americans voted for him. That's 57% of the Electoral College. It ran right through the middle of middle America in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Other states on board, Ohio and Indiana, Iowa, North Carolina, right through middle America. Those same Americans give him high marks for what he's doing. In fact, the Rasmussen survey, the latest polling numbers, give Donald Trump a 57% approval rating now. People on the left say, well, that's it. That's a right-leaning poll. That Rasmussen, we can't trust them. It's also one of the polls, my friends, one of two polls that predicted Donald Trump was going to win on the 8th of November. So how far off is the Rasmussen report? Probably not too far. That's right. Rasmussen said that he would win in November. It says now that his approval ratings continue to grow. By the way, concerning other bans of people coming to this country, what about FDR? He banned, for for the most part, all European refugees from the time he became president in 1933, March, until the middle of 1944. Denied just about everybody. In fact, the St. Louis, a famous ship that was on its way here from Europe, loaded primarily with Jewish refugees, about a 1,000. Was able to dock briefly in Havana, but was rejected there. They only took a couple of dozen folks off. Then they came around the coast of America, could see the lights of Miami, begged for FDR to give them a chance to come because they said they would be slaughtered if they were returned to Europe. He didn't even return the message. He did not respond in any way. The ship, desperate for fuel and supplies, returned to Europe. The vast majority of those folks ended up back in mainland Europe, save for 288 that ended up in the UK. The rest went back to mainland Europe many of which, as many as 300, died in the Holocaust at Auschwitz, Dachau. And I'm not saying FDR was wrong. I'm just telling you that when the the media screams unprecedented, 
They're not telling the truth, or they're not educated enough to know what the truth actually is because they don't do their homework. Just yesterday, I was appearing on the BBC World News broadcast on television worldwide. So I was on the BBC World News, and the commentator got in a, into an argument with me when I pointed out that Trump's executive order is merely enforcing the law that was signed by Barack Obama in December of 2015. She said, well, that's not true. It certainly is true. But even the producers at the BBC and elsewhere haven't done their homework enough to even know what this executive order originates from. She never did concede that she was wrong and I was right, but I am sure by now she may have figured it out because every other story on the planet has it accurately uh, depicted now, though they didn't then. Meanwhile, overnight in Quebec City, Quebec, six people dead, eight injured in a terrorist attack, as the police in Quebec are calling it, a terrorist attack on a mosque there. The two masked attackers using semi-automatic rifles gunning down those worshipping while yelling, Alu Akbar, Alu Akbar. You do the math on it. So a terrorist attack in Quebec City. Uh, by the way, Justin Trudeau says he'll take, he's the new prime minister of Canada, he says he'll take whatever refugees may be turned around here in America and he'll accept them in Canada. Uh, good for him. As Bill Clinton said uh, in 1995, uh, ours is a nation of laws. Ours is a nation of In fact, I think we've got that short clip, I believe. Let's, let's hear Bill Clinton just talking about immigration and refugees and so on and so forth in general during the State of the Union address in 1995. Roll that. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it. Standing ovation at the State of the Union address. We must do more to stop the abuse of our immigration laws over the past many years. That was in 1995. I suppose that if, if a Democrat says that they're a hero, if a Republican says that they're a bigot and a xenophobe. Back in a moment on the Steve Gruber Show. Covering Michigan and the world from his bunker below the bridge. Here is Steve Gruber. Welcome back to it. I'm glad you're sticking it out with me. Uh, we got the ratings in for the program, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your support, and there is a lot of it. And uh, and apparently this uh, brisk pace is going to continue for the next four years. I would assume that it is. Um, so I want to get through a couple of other things. I was just really taken. I was really taken. I, I, I spoke of this last week, but Theresa May, I thought, was terrific. The Prime Minister of the U.K., in her speech on Thursday, to Republicans gathered in Philadelphia, I thought was spectacular. And then with a pre uh, during a press conference a little bit later, Theresa May discussed the future of economic and defense cooperation with the United States. I like her attitude. I like what she has to say. I'd like to share just a bit of that with you today. It's clip 11. Theresa May, the new Iron Lady, if you will. Go. On defense and security cooperation, we're united in our recognition of NATO as the bulwark of our collective defense. And today, we've reaffirmed our unshakable commitment to this alliance. Mr. President, I think you said you confirmed that you're 100% behind NATO. But we're also discussing the importance of NATO continuing to ensure it is as equipped to fight terrorism and cyber warfare as it is to fight more conventional forms of war. And uh, I've agreed to continue my efforts to encourage my fellow European leaders to deliver on their commitments to spend 2% of their GDP on defence so that the burden is more fairly shared. It's only by investing properly in our defence that we can ensure we're properly equipped to face our shared challenges together. And finally, the President and I uh, have uh, mentioned future economic cooperation and trade. Uh, trade between our two countries is already worth over £150 billion a year. 
The US is the single biggest source of inward investment to the UK, and together we have around $1 trillion invested in each other's economies. And the UK-US defence relationship is the broadest, deepest and most advanced of any two countries sharing military hardware and expertise. And I think the President and I are ambitious to build on this relationship in order to grow our respective economies, provide the high-skilled, high-paid jobs of the future for working people across America and across the UK. And there, yeah, and I just think that she is. I think it's refreshing, quite honestly, that we have somebody that is a conservative on the other side of the pond. There, a conservative for the first time, a true conservative for the first time since Margaret Thatcher, that she is concerned with trade and relationships with the United States and the common defense, and encouraging their other partners in NATO to spend the two percent of the GDP that is basically required by the pact that most of these nations have not honored and observed. So, Theresa May, I, I tip my hat to you and glad you were here and look forward to hearing more from you. I think it's an exciting new age and an exciting new day. And, and, and let's be honest, both Donald Trump and Theresa May need a good, solid friend in the world, and you could have none better. You could have none better than what we have between the U.K. and the U.S. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Also on... The diplomatic front. It's a new day for the United Nations, for the United States. Now, of course, you realize that Donald Trump is no big fan of the United Nations. I'm not either. I believe that the United Nations has failed at its core mission. Its core mission is to end genocide and ethnic cleansing and warfare and slaughter. It has been a dismal failure at all of those things. Whether you look uh, at Syria, or you look backwards to things like Darfur and farther back to the killing fields of Cambodia. I feel the United Nations has failed at its core mission. Well, the United States has a new ambassador now to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, arriving for her first day of work at the U.N., promising fresh eyes, new strength, and a new vision. It's clip 13. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, now the U.N. ambassador to the United Nations. Clip 13. Go. Clip 13. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So in South Carolina, we start off the day's great. Um, you know, it's a thrill to be here at the UN. I will tell you that um, we have hit the ground running. There is a new US UN. We talked to the staff yesterday, and you are going to see a change in the way we do business. It's no longer about working harder, it's about working smarter. And we have a fantastic team at the USUN that's ready to prove that. Our goal um, with the administration is to show value at the UN. And the way that we'll show value is to show our strength, show our voice, um, have the backs of our allies, and make sure that our allies have our back as well. For those that don't have our back, we're taking names. We will make points to respond to that accordingly. Um, but this is a time of strength. This is a time of action. This is a time of getting things done. And this administration is prepared and ready to go in, um, to have me go in, look at the UN, and everything that's working, we're going to make it better. Everything that's not working, we're going to try and fix. And anything that is seems to be obsolete and not necessary, we're going to do away with. But this is a time of fresh eyes, um, new strength, new vision, and a great day at the US UN. Thank you very much. And there you have it, uh, Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, taking her new position as the United Nations ambassador from the United States. Looks like she's up for the job. Of course, she was criticized as well as being, you know, unfit and controversial and so on and so forth. Just like everything that Donald Trump does, according to the left, mm -hmm. according to the left. In fact, like I said, if he says it's lunchtime, you know, that they would complain if it was five minutes either side of noon. They would find a reason to complain if it was five minutes either side of, of noon. All right. By now, you've probably heard of us uh, talking about CRTV here on the program. CRTV just launched an all-digital conservative media network that you need to know about. It features exclusive commercial-free TV shows from heavyweight conservatives like Mark Levin, Michelle Malkin, Mark Stein, and Steven Crowder, to just name a few. Right now, you can get a full year of CRTV for less than $9 a month. Watch every CRTV show on demand on any of your favorite devices. Uh, to sign up right now, go to CRTV.com slash Gruber. It's all one word. 
Again, that's CRTV.com slash Gruber. Get on board and, well, tell them Steve sent you. Take a quick break here on this Monday. You are listening, of course, to The Steve Gruber Show. Keeping you in touch with Michigan and the world. It's 33 after on this Monday. It's it's a lot to keep up with. I could only imagine working in the Trump White House. Uh, all the things you have to do because it seems to me two or three or four things every day. And of course, everything is controversial. When he calls for lunch, it's controversial. Apparently to those on the left in the media, the commentators, the Hollywood elite, the activists, it doesn't seem to matter much what happens. It's controversial. My next guest, Dr. Tom Coburn, former senator from the state of Oklahoma, an outspoken conservative. Uh, Senator, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Glad to have you here. Um, First of all, what is your take um, on this this whole ordeal over the temporary ban of allowing folks in from seven countries? Of course, for people that do know, it was a law uh, signed in 2015 by Barack Obama, now being enforced by President Trump. What do you make of it? Well, I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. I think probably some of the preparation before it happened, before it happened, they needed to anticipate where the backups would be. But I don't. Uh, that's a, that's a, a learning mistake that I'm sure they've they've known. But uh, it's absolutely enforcing the rule of law is one of the things that's tearing our country apart. That the fact that we're not enforcing it, and uh, so I think enforcing the law. If you don't like the law, Congress should change it. But you shouldn't go after an administration who's sworn to uphold the law. Well, we are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws, as you amply put it, Senator. And I appreciate that point of view. Uh, it seems, though, it doesn't matter what this what this president does. It's controversial. And now you've probably read and seen, as we have, that the Democrats, those on the other side, are going to use a scorched earth policy. They're not going to work on pre- with President Trump on anything, they say. How's that going to work? Oh, it's not going to work well because, for example, the swing states or the the purple states that, and blue states that went red, all he's going to do is tweak against the individual congressmen and, and senators and say, you know, you all wanted this to happen. Why don't you contact them? You know, he, he's a master at putting you in a box uh, with his tweets, and I, I think it's probably a pretty dangerous policy for him. And I think it's you know, the the thing is, is we need decisions made that are in the best interest of our long-term country, not the best interest of a political party or a politician. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be really fun and interesting to watch what happens the next six months in Washington, because it's going to get turned upside down. And you can't play games with Trump. You're either with him or against him. And if you're against him, he's going to, he's going to make you pay the price for being against him. If, in fact, your state, you know, if you look at states and they want a lot of these things. Well, well, they did, and they, I, I would guess that Oklahoma would stay red until the earth finally uh, freezes over again. Uh, but in places like Michigan, where I am, the closest margin of all 10,000 votes, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, the key to his victory, I, I would suggest that if the election were held today based on what he's done thus far, he would win by a wider margin. He would I win by a wider that. margin. I would agree with that. But remember, most people don't realize there's more Democrats in Oklahoma than there are Republicans. Uh, and what they are is old conservative uh, Southern Democrats that just have never switched their their party. They still believe in the principles of the Constitution and the separation of powers. And, you know, the foundational principles are important to the people of Oklahoma. And then we have a a group of about 25% that are hard left. All right, well, let's talk about uh, something else that is going to get a lot of attention. Uh, Supreme Court nominees probably going to get picked as early as today. That'll get a lot of attention, but so will... Where we are as far as national debt goes, $20 trillion, give or take a few billion. What's a few billion among friends, right, Senator? Um, And Senator Tom Coburn with us right now. But if we don't get our debt under control and get things prioritized in Washington, um, the future does not look bright. And, in fact, the CBO's own uh, projections show unsustainable fiscal situations going forward in America. What are we to do? Well, first of all, you start making the hard decisions that you need to make, and it's not just the debt, the twenty trillion. We have one hundred and forty-four trillion dollars of unfunded liability. That over the next seven seventy-five years, the millennials will owe one point seven million dollars a piece on that. Their net worth right now is a minus seven thousand. So it's it's not only that we will collapse financially; it's that you've robbed the standard of living 
from the people 35 and younger. So and how do we correct that? I mean, I mean, the way you correct it is to take the money out of Washington and rebalance the, the three branches of government, rebalance the relationship between the states and the federal government, and then cut the $400 billion a year in waste, fraud, and duplication that everybody knows is there, but they don't want to vote for it because all that waste, fraud, and duplication has a constituency. Well, that's right, because it goes back to the different uh, congressional districts in the form of, well, uh, pork, you know, pork uh, spending um, uh, promises and so forth. They're, they're buying sure. votes with it. Sure. Let me give you an example. Job training programs, they reformed it. They saved about $100 million. But we spent $12.8 billion a year on 64 different federal job training programs. And how many jobs did we get out of that, do you think? Well, not many. Uh, because what they've done is that most of, if you look at where those job training programs place their people, it's in fast food restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, in other words, we're not training them to be a heat and air conditioning mechanic or a plumber or electrician or a machinist. What we're doing is training them on something that they really don't need much training for. No, we're telling them. We're telling all these the federal to, dollars to get reimbursed for that. And the other problem I think that we have here, Senator, that doesn't get near enough attention, we're telling every kid, every kid, everybody's got to go to college. Everybody has to go. Well, that's not true. You need plumbers and carpenters and machinists and, and a host of other things in this world. Everybody doesn't need to go to college to be, you know, a big success in this world. Fine, fine. I agree with you. So, all right, so what you, do you think should be the first? Uh, he, uh, the president wants to cut taxes. He wants to do a trillion dollars in infrastructure spending. He wants to rein, uh, reinforce the military. All of these things cost money. How do we get our debt under control if we do that list of things? Well, it's easy. It's not hard. Is you have $400 billion that's fully documented by the, uh, uh, the uh, Congressional Budget Office and uh, the uh, General Accounting Office. A hundred billion of that's just fraud, Medicare and Medicaid. There's another 30 billion in, in other tax programs that are fraudulent that haven't been worked by the IRS. You have all this duplication, which counts for another hundred billion. If you just eliminate 90% of the duplication, you'd have a hundred billion a year to spend. Uh, on an infrastructure program. So if you eliminate the fraud, if you eliminate the stupidity, and you eliminate <laughs> the duplication, you'll have $300, $325 billion a year to spend. Well, $100 billion of that could go to a tax cut for those that most need it. $100 billion could go to, to uh, enhance the uh, infrastructure. And $100 billion could go to the, the military. This isn't hard. It's only hard because you got politicians making decisions that are what's best for their career versus what's best for the country. And their career wins most of the time. Yeah, because what's best for their for their career is bringing these, these money. park projects back to their district and spending money in their district, whether it you know creates any real long-term benefit or not. That's what we get out of this. All right, so I'll give you the last word, Senator. I'll give you 30 seconds to tell me where, where we are today. What do you think about what's happening and where we go next? Well, where we go next, let me answer that first. The way to fix this, our founders gave us a way to restore the balance between the federal government and the states and restore the balance between the judiciary, executive, and legislative branch. And that's called an Article 5 Convention of States. You can read about it on conventionofstates.com. That's how you actually fix it. And the founders trusted the states and their representatives in their legislature to keep a balance, keep a watchful eye on what was supposed to be a very limited federal government. So that's a... That's how you fix it. Number two is you create transparency all across the board, and that's starting to happen with a website called OpenTheBooks.com. OpenTheBooks.com, Senator. We got, we'll need to leave it right there, Senator. We're up against a heartbreak. OpenTheBooks.com. But love to have you back, Senator. Great conversation. I Try feel like we just it. got started. All right, man. There it is. OpenTheBooks.com. Covering Michigan and the world from his bunker below the bridge. Here is Steve Gruber. What a ride it has been so far. <laughs> can't, can't wait to see what this week brings. Um, our next guest, not available all of a sudden. Boris Epstein was supposed to be here. A spokesman for the Trump administration. But apparently... We just got a call from his his handler, said he's been called into an emergency meeting. He is at the White House currently. 
Uh, we hope to reschedule him for tomorrow. Boris Epstein been on here uh, this program many, many times. Um, so he was called, summoned to the White House. I'm going to guess probably about this ongoing conversation about refugees and so forth. Uh, but let's go over a few facts. The two biggest um, executive orders signed so far, I would say, without question, are the temporary ban on refugees from seven countries signed uh, over the weekend. And then, of course, before that, the executive order on building the wall on the southern border with Mexico to move forward with that. And again, that's a, that's also a previously existing law signed in 2006, by the way, by President George W. Bush, but then it was never funded by Congress because the Democrats took over in 2007 and the funding never arrived. So here are two things that, that Donald Trump has done as president of the United States that were merely enforcing existing laws on the books. I mean, let's be honest about uh, the things, fun facts that journalists know but don't seem to want to report. Number one, that Donald Trump did not create these laws. His executive orders carried out existing law. Concerning the immigration, the refugee um, uh, uh, order, the text of Trump's executive order on immigration doesn't list the particular countries. That formula was in the existing law that his order is carrying out. All right, the law Trump is carrying out is the Visa Waiver Program Improvement and Terrorist Travel Prevention Act signed into law by President Barack Obama December 18th, 2015. It was part of an omnibus bill spending package signed by Barack Obama December the 18th, 2015. It's not something that Donald Trump made up over the weekend. He is merely enforcing the law as it has been put forth. And Donald Trump is doing exactly as he promised he would. And that's the shock for the media. You have a politician here that is doing, in very short order, exactly what he said he would do. 62 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. 57% of the Electoral College went to Donald Trump. Donald Trump's approval rating is also 57% now, according to Rasmussen's latest poll. And those on the left say, well, Rasmussen, it's not a credible poll. It's a right-leaning poll. Yeah. It's also a poll, my friends, that said Donald Trump was going to win the election and defeat Hillary Clinton. So before you dismiss the Rasmussen poll out of hand, you might want to take into effect that he said that Donald Trump was going to win one of two polls, the IBD tip poll and the Rasmussen poll. And, of course, yours truly told you that Donald Trump was going to win by going through Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. But they don't want to talk about that. They want nothing to do with that. And then you go down to the southern border. The southern border has been a point of contention for many years. In fact, Ronald Reagan made a deal and gave amnesty to 3 million, 3 million people here illegally from south of the border back in the 1980s. And at the time, he was promised, he was promised that a wall would be built at that time. Of course, the Democrats never held up their end of the deal, never funded it, never put it together. So then years later, in 2005, it was renegotiated. And in 2006, George W. Bush put together a deal to have the wall built. In came the new Congress in 2007. They never funded it. They refused to get it done. So all Donald Trump is doing is he's telling Congress to enforce the law that already exists. In fact, during Bill Clinton's administration, he said we had no choice but to deal with illegal aliens coming to America from all sorts of places of origin. In fact, during the 1995 State of the Union address, President Bill Clinton laid it out very nicely, the problems that we face when it comes to the abuse of the immigration system. Go ahead, roll that clip. It's Bill Clinton, number 16. All Americans, not only in the states most heavily affected, but in every place in this country, are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public service they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more, by hiring a record number of new border guards, by deporting twice as many criminal aliens as ever before, by cracking down on illegal hiring, by barring welfare benefits to illegal aliens. In the budget I will present to you, we will try to do more to speed the deportation of illegal aliens who are arrested for crimes, to better identify illegal aliens in the workplace 
as recommended by the commission headed by former Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it. And for the next little while, he gets a standing ovation. We must do more to stop it. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are a nation of laws first and foremost. And I go back to what I've discussed here on this program for years now. We do not have a broken immigration system. We don't. The people that tell you we have a broken immigration system are wrong. What we have is a failure, a blatant, a blatant failure and intentional failure in enforcing the existing laws. We have failed to enforce the laws that are already on the books. We had an immigration system that worked at Ellis Island and has worked for decades since, where we evaluate the background of the people coming into our nation. We check where they came from, who their family is, what their health situation is, what their capacity for work is, what their educational level is. Can they contribute to this country, to this great nation of ours? There is nothing wrong with our immigration system. There is something wrong when people in this country refuse to enforce the laws that are already on the books. And that, my friends, needs to change. Back in a moment.